otherwise you don't get the prize. Now as a younger man, my next guest outraged the country as a member of Shock Rockers, the Virgin Prunes. He's now a celebrated artist and he's one of the few Irish artists brave enough to mount an exhibition at the moment. Please welcome Guggy. to have you here. Um, I, I said there in the intro that you're, you're one of the few artists brave enough to put on an exhibition at the moment. I know that it, the art world, like everything else, is suffering a bit at the moment. And is the reason a lot of artists are laying low is because they're afraid to show and then for the stuff not to be bought? Is that the situation? Well, I suppose, I mean, I don't know. I guess different artists make, you know, decisions based on different things. Um, but it's probably got something to do with that. But, you know, when I paint, I paint, I'm never thinking of selling my work. I'm always pictured being shown. And showing my work is what makes me dig really deep. And it's what makes me want to get better. So, no, there's no money around at the moment. But uh, I think it's a great time to show. People are broke, you know, they don't want to pay into events. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, I did this exhibition of my latest work in the Carlin Gallery because I want people to see it. And anyone who's wrong town, it's quite central there, they can just pop it's in. It's pretty central, South Anne's Lane off South Anne Street, which is off Grafton Street. It's free in. It's a wonderful show, guys. you got to check it out. It, it is a good show. How is it selling, Boogie? You know what, actually, it's um, selling shite. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> that was a kind of a joke, because actually it's, it's, it's okay. It's we'll, okay, is it? We'll cover the costs, we'll cover the costs. Okay. Yeah, but it's yeah. about showing, that's what, that's what drives me. Yeah, that's what yeah, makes yeah. me want to do it. The, the one thing is though, when you, 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 when you put it out there, um, for people, you do as an artist, and I imagine it's quite a personal thing to be an artist, you enter into this kind of bizarre thing then where there are the art critics who can come in and interpret what it's all about and say it's good or bad or whatever. I mean, you got a pretty you got a pretty sniffy kind of review in the Sunday Times for the exhibition, didn't you? Is it Christine Lee? <laughs> well, you know what? I guess the odd one like that um, keeps you on your toes. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, I think there was some. Does it annoy you though? Does it know? Well, you know something, I love positive criticism, and I mean, if I read critique that is going to help me further on down the road, I think that's a wonderful thing, I think it's a positive thing, because it's, uh, it's, it's a pair of fresh eyes. Yeah. Um, she was making the point that this was very safe, that she felt it was all very safe, um, and that the, the, the Googie, the, the post-punk or the punk rocker who's in the Virgin Brooms, would maybe have a thing or two to teach this 53-year-old Gogi about shopping that, that, and not being so okay. safe. Okay, yeah. look, you know, I mean, when I parted company with the Virgin Prunes to paint full-time, I painted before the Virgin Prunes, I painted during the Virgin Prunes, and when I parted company with them to paint full-time, I think had I have done, you know, crazy dark paintings and spray blood all over them. I think that's the easiest thing I could have done, yeah, yeah. as it happens. I mean, the only audience that knew me, the only audience that was aware of me, were the Virgin Brune audience. So the easiest thing for me to do would have been, you know, paintings that had the wow factor and the shock factor. But that's not what I did. I didn't believe that my painting vocation should go there. Um, what I did was I painted the pictures that that I thought I needed to do. I mean, I'm interested in light, I'm interested in colour, I'm interested in surface. Um, and I wasn't interested in going to that place, you know, the shock factor. So in fact, if I sat down in a calculated way, which the word safe suggests, I don't think I could have picked 
a less safe subject yeah. matter. Um, so safe or not safe or easy, they've never been part of my vocabulary. And listen, I, I know w w one thing you say about being an artist is that every time you go at a canvas or, or at that sculpture now or whatever, that you're trying to fix something. You're trying to fix something in you, is it? Or trying to complete something? Look, well, I was in Switzerland lately and I saw this wonderful interview with uh, an American writer. Shame on me, I can't remember his name. But he spoke about, you know, creative people and any artist that he had ever come across um, was in some way a damaged person. And they were trying to put something right by creating art that in some way satisfied something or completed something, you know, in them and their feelings and their personality. Um, and I do take that point. What's your damage, you reckon? Well, you know, whatever my damage is, actually, I know people that aren't artists that I think are probably more damaged than I am. Uh -huh. But we're all trying to come to terms with our past. I guess yeah. we're all trying to fix things. And for me, when I'm working on painting, you know, I work in a cluttered studio. Life is complicated. The one thing I can put right, or the one thing that I can attempt to put right, is the yeah. painting that I'm working on right now. Yeah, yeah. So and it's a little corner of the universe. Yeah, that control. and that's something that maybe I can fix, and that's made something that I can strive towards putting right. Yeah. But speaking of, of being damaged and fixing yourself and all that, there's another kind of another undercurrent you, which people would be surprised uh, looking at you, is that your faith is very important to you. I know it's still very important. When you were a kid, though, uh, you, there was a lot of faith in the house, and it, I get the impression it was quite intense in, in your house in Ballymun then, yeah? Yeah, it was pretty intense. We came from Cedarwood Road in Ballymun, old Ballymun, I guess, as it's probably known as now. And, no, my parents had a very strong faith. Um, and it was a little bit an unusual one for Ballymun as well. Were you, were, how would you do? Was it Pentecostals, or are we... Well, Christian Brethren. Uh, okay. actually was the name of the, that's how they refer to themselves. Um, my good mate Gavin Friday and his late dad, who was also a friend of mine, Pascal, always reminded me that in fact it wasn't Christian Brethren, it was Plymouth Brethren, uh -huh. which they shortened to the Plims. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess it was pretty intense, you know, it was pretty strict. Um, and pretty extreme. I went to church on a Sunday morning from half ten till twelve o'clock. We went to the park for a little run around, home for lunch, back to Sunday school. After Sunday school we went to the boys department of the YMCA. The, the big rush was on to get over to the seven o'clock service in sure, Mary Hall. Yeah. Um, which finished at eight o'clock and then the next rush back to the YMCA in Middle Abbey Street for the 8.30. Um, well, I've no regrets about that, you know, nothing that I learned there um, I could possibly disagree with. Really, yeah? That's, yeah, I mean, I'm not so pushy with my kids. We go to church generally once on a Sunday. But it stood to me, and my faith has been incredibly important to me right through my life. My mum said something that I thought was quite beautiful a few months ago. She said, I don't know how anybody can go through life without faith. Yeah. And my mom has an incredible faith. Yeah, my mother says exactly mom. the same thing all the time. Though, without Your mom does. Yeah, without her faith. Yeah, she, I mean, yeah. faith is an incredible thing. Yeah. And I just, I have a basic Christian faith. People think I'm religious. I don't like religion. You know, I don't like robes and candles and crosses and all of the theatre, for instance, that takes yeah. place in the... Roman Catholic Church, or to an extent in the Church of Ireland, but my faith is a simple faith. Um, Could we, the, other, the other thing I wanted, because I'm, I'm conscious of time and stuff, the, yeah. the other thing that has stood to you down the years, and it comes from, from those days on Cedarwood Road as well, is, I guess, friendship. And, and I suppose I would have always thought maybe it was an escape from all the religion at home or whatever, that you and your friends created this imaginary kind of little creative, artistic world uh, way back then, and, and you've held on to kind of that 
and the friendships and everything too, haven't you? Well, perhaps it was escapism. I mean, I don't know. I suppose at the age of three or four or five, you don't analyze these things. But something that I recognize as being incredibly important to me when I was very young um, was friendship. You know, your friends didn't know what went on at home. Um, I met Bono when I don't have a great memory of that time. He thinks he was three and I was four which in the coming months will be a 50-year friendship. Um, wow. But yeah, friendship was incredibly important to me. And then we met, we were seen as oddballs on the street. We weren't in the Gaelic games. We didn't know how to kick a ball when it came to soccer. Um, it's, a, it's a strange way, I suppose, we felt odd. But I guess we were, you know, young artists that didn't realize that we were artists, we were mm. creative people. And I think that's how we found each other. And I think that's why our friendship to each other became so incredibly important. And yeah, it's a wonderful thing to come through life with the same people and to have the same friends from childhood. In our very early teens, we met Gavin, Gavin Friday, mm. um, and other friends that, whose names people might not know. But yeah, a small community of oddballs from Cedarwood Road and the surrounding area. Right to this point, we have come through life together and we have all vastly benefited from that. Yeah, perfect. Come here, um, I need to, on a more superficial note, I need to ask you about, the hair is a bit of a trademark, like, you know, my mother or whatever, people who don't necessarily know a lot about what you do, would say, oh, Googie, he's the fellow with the hair, you know? And then, of course, when you and the, the, the family are, are, are all out as well, you make a very striking, I think we have a big, there you are with all the kids and they all have the hair and everything. Is there any significance to the, to the hair? <laughs> they all used to have the hair. All right. I think in this latest post photograph, if you're looking, my three middle boys got their hair cut. Are they rebelling? Well, I, maybe they're rebelling. You know, I mean, we rebelled. We came through the, uh, you know, the punk movement. Um, I think our generation were probably the most rebellious generation, you know, for in recent generations. I mean, we had the Sex Pistols, the Slits, the Damned, you yeah. know, the Clash, and indeed the Virgin Prunes. But so I guess if your dad is an old punk, your your rebellion is to cut your hair and get a job. Yeah, and that's <laughs> well, maybe it is. But you know what? My kids rebel against me by having the short back and sides and wearing Hollister. Yeah, yeah. So they got into the Hollister rebellion. <laughs> My kids have the same haircut as my dad had, and the same cut as my grandfather and my great grandfather yeah. had. So I think we were the generation of rebellion. You think you're the last that's great rebels? Right. Well, listen, that's as good a note as any to, to end on. Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby.